Pan Am jet shot down in Vietnam, no survivors. 25,000 U.S. troops were still there when I arrived, and they were all gone by June of 1973. Inside gone in approximately two hours. That was, that was a very, very scary time for me. They'll be here before May 1st. Then you hear an explosion, then you hear an office full of people screaming and running out in the street. Don't go telling anybody it's the last flight. They just want to be responsible for a riot. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm here today with, um, you know, someone I've been wanting to talk to for a long time. I mean, I say that about every guest, but this one has probably been the longest, I think five years, six years, set my, side, my sights on. Al, tell us a bit about yourself and uh, who you are. Okay. Well, uh, we, our family immigrated to the United States uh, way back in 1946 from Jamaica. And believe it or not, Back then, uh, there were no 747s or DC-8s or 707s. We flew from Kingston, Jamaica to Miami, believe it or not, on a Pan Am DC-6, I believe it was, uh, which is a far cry from what we have today. But little did I know at that time that, uh, that one day and many years later, I would be on a different Pan Am airplane on a totally different mission. And, and that mission being... Vietnam, the last flight out of Vietnam. I joined Pan Am in 1969 as a sales rep in New York, and I was transferred to San Francisco, which is probably uh, one of my favorite cities uh, in the United States. One of the things I always wanted to do in in the airline business was uh, to be a station manager. So my boss in, in San Francisco uh, approached me one day, and he said... Uh, I'm looking at your annual review and I see you're interested in becoming a station manager. I said, oh yeah, that's that's my long-term or short-term goal. He said to me uh, that there are some opportunities coming up in the Pacific Division and maybe you'd be interested in going out and into that division. And he said, he's going to be sent back to, to Hong Kong and I'd be working for him. I said, oh, that's great. So he said... Um, you would be the Pan Am official company representative in charge of all of Pan Am operations in that country. I said, that sounds exciting. He says, well, uh, what I'm looking for is someone to run our operations in Saigon, South Vietnam, and Nam Pen, <laughs> Cambodia. <laughs> I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> no. I said, no, I don't think I'd, I'd want to go out there. Uh, you know, I, I like it here in San Francisco, and it doesn't appeal to me to go out to a war zone to work. He said, well, look, they've got uh, peace talks going on in Paris. Things are looking good. They may have an agreement coming up pretty soon, and you'll have a challenge to, you know, get get South Vietnam back on the on the map for tourists and development. I said, no, I don't think so. He said, look, don't, don't make a decision right now. He says, think about it. In fact, why don't you get on an airplane and go out there and take a look around and see what you think? So I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So I went out to Vietnam and I'll tell you, uh, flying into Vietnam, I was like a kid on my first flight. I'm looking out the window as we approach the uh, South Vietnam coastline and I'm looking for the war. I mean, you know, we who who doesn't know about the Vietnam War? So I'm, we're look. I'm looking out, and we're as we're approaching the coastline. I see different kinds of military aircraft flying below, crisscrossing. I see uh, bomb craters and so on. And I said, yeah, this this is the war zone for sure. Anyhow, I spent a week out there and met our staff and met some folks went to the embassy met the ambassador and met a few other folks and uh, a lot of other representatives from other companies you know seemed to enjoy the assignment um, people from like shell oil exxon ibm bank of america citibank they were all out there so i decided to go ahead and take the assignment so i started working there in november of 1972 as a pan am director for uh saigon and Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Having started that, you know, position, what were the first signs that you had to evacuate from Vietnam? I know it's a big jump, but you know, you know, this is all the that all that emotion, you know, that the ceasefire was reached in uh, January of uh, nineteen seventy, and uh, the war was officially over, but. The ceasefire agreement, in my opinion, was very fragile, and I didn't think it was going to to be effective. But anyhow, it was in fact 
uh, uh, approved by all the parties concerned, and Vietnam was now the Vietnam War is now over. But the war was really never over because throughout that period up until '75, I could still hear those booms off in the distance almost every night. So the war was still going on. It's like they say, uh, someone didn't get the memo type of thing. Things began to unravel in early 1975. And what was happening was uh, the U.S. had cut off all aid to Vietnam, basically, and the South Vietnamese uh, military um, pulled back all of their people from the northern part of South Vietnam towards Saigon to protect Saigon. In the meantime, North Vietnam, who had always said that if it takes a thousand years, yeah. they're going to make Vietnam one country. And that's what we were facing. And uh, the troops from the north started marching south, and there was no resistance. So you could tell that it was just a matter of time before this thing was going to get pretty ugly. The problem I had was uh, we had to start planning to evacuate our employees because uh, the word was that if you uh, worked for the U.S. government or you were a U.S. military type person, uh, and working for Pan Am actually was considered to be working for the U.S. government. I mean, Pan Am was uh, America's flag carrier, and we were well known there in Vietnam. We operated, at one time, we operated what they called the R&R flights, and it created a uh, an operation that was the largest operation in the entire Pan Am system in the world with the uh, frequency of flights we operated out of Saigon with the uh, rest and recuperation for the GIs that were there. And uh, that was all over when I got there, but uh, we had about 25,000 U.S. troops were still there when I arrived, and they were all gone by June of 1973, 73. They were all gone by then. And um, things were, were, you know, pretty much normal, except the war was still going on. And with the reduction in aid to South Vietnam and South Vietnamese military giving up all the territory they once controlled, it was now just sort of a cakewalk for the North to come in and take over. And so that's what we were faced with. In the movie, you know, I'm always going to be, you know, the movie's our biggest source here. You know, I mean, I know I have you right in front of me, but um, I hope the movie didn't get this wrong. Um, in, the, in the opening scene on April 22nd, 1975, three days before the, um, I believe three or four days before the real evacuation, um, you know, this comment made by not direct, I guess not directly by you, but you're the actor playing you, uh, you know, they must not be, they must not be loving their family, but surely love their cats and dogs because everyone's sending, you know, that was what you said. The embassy staff was sell, is sending all their cats and dogs back, but not their family members, you know? Yeah, they had priority. Uh, <laughs> Cats and dogs were being loaded, and sometimes without the owners, sometimes with the owners. But uh, that was the priority to get the animals out before things, you know, really got out of hand. And uh, I was watching these kennels being loaded in the belly of the airplane, and off they went. So throughout this whole time, did you feel that you know there were so many people waiting outside the airport? to try to get into the air, you know, to try to get on this flight when, when they found, when people found out that this was the last flight. So did you feel that, you know, Pan Am abandoned you and it's, it's people in Vietnam and this whole operation or, you know, could they have done more helping with this? Our employees were, I think, getting concerned about my ability to, to evacuate them out in time. In fact, I was unable to tell them how, we were going to do it and when we were going to do it because that frankly i didn't i didn't know myself because the uh, the south vietnamese government was still in charge which means if you were a vietnamese citizen you needed a visa and passport and so on to get out of the country and normally that process could take two months three months whatever that was a difficult thing i, I just had to tell our staff to uh Start planning, but I can't tell you the details at this time. And just trust me and have faith, and uh, it, it's going to work out, even though I, I knew at the time I didn't have a final plan because of the uh, getting the proper paperwork approved by the Vietnamese government. But that all changed uh, on April 4th, 
1975, when we started the uh, operation called Operation Baby Lift, where we were carrying all these South Vietnamese uh, orphans out of the country. They were going to be adopted by folks in the United States and Europe as well. And uh, because of that tragedy on the C5A crash, which was like, I believe it was 130, right? 130. It was, a, it, was it took, the aircraft took right out of, uh, off, out of Saigon and 100, and then the plane crashed and 130 babies died. Yeah. I think the total number of fatalities, including the kids was around 155, something like that. I'm not sure. I think that's the number. But when that occurred, uh, Pan Am jumped into action because we had a, a guy in Connecticut chartered a 747 along with one of the adoption agencies. And in, within 24 hours, Pan Am had two 747s in Vietnam to evacuate uh, almost 700 children on two airplanes. And uh, we had volunteer crew, volunteer doctors, volunteer nurses, and so on. And the Vietnamese government decided at that point we would they would waive all of the uh, bureaucracy in terms of getting paperwork for adoptions and just let them go they they didn't want to have any of these kids especially the mixed race kids uh still in vietnam when i saw that the light bulb went off in my head and that was if they're waiving all the adoption papers for these babies what would happen if i told the government I want to adopt our employees and their families. So I got a hold of our human resources supervisor, had him go down to the ministry, the foreign ministry, and I said to him, we need to see if we can get approval to have me adopt all the employees and their families to go to the United States. And he kind of looked at me as if I had lost it, that <laughs> how am I going to adopt all these people? Well, what happened was... Uh, he went down to the ministry and came back with a whole bunch of documents, um, and it's all in Vietnamese. And he said, just sign them. And I signed everything. <laughs> <laughs> I signed. I had no idea what I was signing. And then he took it back down to the ministry, and they approved it, which I was stunned. I was shocked. So that was finally, I, uh, there was a way out, and it was legal because we were all stamped by the Vietnamese government. The next challenge was... Pan Am had committed to the employees that we would adopt them, all the staff, and their immediate family. Well, um, the immediate family definition for Pan Am was the employee and the spouse and the kids. The immediate family definition for the Vietnamese was quite different. It was everybody in the family, grandma, grandpa, everyone. So when I got a list of all the names of the employees and their immediate family, we had a list that was numbering around 700. And at which point I, I told our staff, I told our managers that uh, we're going to have to do something about this number. And I said, I can't tell you who to leave behind and who to, to evacuate. Uh, who to take with you. That's a difficult situation. So I'll leave it up to you guys to to work it out the Vietnamese way and uh, and see if we can get that number down. So we did end eventually get it down to um, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 315 or 320. And that was acceptable. But uh, I'll tell you that uh, that was a very, very difficult situation for them to make that to make that decision to leave some family members behind and we had uh, one employee that uh, stayed behind because he had a very large family he had eight children and his mother was too sick to travel he didn't want to leave her alone there so he stayed behind and uh, believe it or not uh, I, I was very concerned about him because once they found out, you know, once they took over, the North Vietnamese took over, they would they would go door to door and interrogate everybody to find out who they worked for. And if you worked for the embassy or you've worked for a big American company like Pan Am, you were subject to uh, being introduced to what they call the re-education camp. And that's where he ended up uh, 15 years later. I received a letter from him 
and he told me that he almost died in the camp. He was in a uh, cargo container on the tarmac. That was sort of their prison cell. And he got so sick that uh, they sent him home to die, and he, he didn't die. He survived, and uh, he wrote me this letter, and he wanted to know if I could try to get him and some of his children out now, 15 years later, and I was just floored by that letter when I saw it. How did he find you, though? How did he end up finding you? Dude? You know what? I'm working for the chairman at the time, the, uh, the 46th floor of the Pan Am building in New York City, and I get this letter on my desk from the mailroom, and it says, Mr. Allen Topping, Pan American, New York. USA. <laughs> <laughs> Most general type and of way. I, I got whatever. the letter. I mean, you know, the Pan Am building in New York is, is quite a place. I mean, every post office knows all about it. So it ended up on my desk. It was just amazing. Sh sh I, I'll try that still today. No. <laughs> <laughs> so it showed up on your desk and he, he really was writing to you and getting out and you were able to, and you were able to get them out. Yeah. I, I started to uh, look at it and think about it. And I went back to Vietnam and found out that there was a way that I could get him and three of his youngest children out. It would require sponsoring him. So I came back to, I spent a week there or so and I came back to New York and started working on it and started doing some, fundraising and filling out a lot of paperwork to get to get him so eventually they arrived here uh in 1990 uh i'm sorry uh, 92 they arrived in 92 him and three of his youngest daughters they they arrived here they arrived in miami and uh it was it was amazing that after all those years um that you know, it happened. In fact, I took a copy of the movie with me to Vietnam and before... <laughs> did, they, did they search you upon entering, you know, knowing that you were Mr. Topping, you know, like, oh. No, no, no. As a matter of fact, some of our employees that were already here in the States, they were worried that I might get interrogated or something and, and end up in, in, in some kind of a situation there that may not be all that, you know, great. But they didn't, uh, you know... They didn't ask me any questions. They just stamped me in and and I went. But I think, I'll tell you what, this is true. Instead of staying in a hotel, I stayed in sort of a uh, very small hotel. It's kind of like a rooming house they had set up for me. And I, I left my luggage on the bed in such a way that if someone opened it, and looked through it, I could tell that I had things set up in a certain way. Sure enough, when I came back to the room that day, someone was in the room mm. and looked. But I had nothing in there that was, you know, incriminating or anything. So it was okay. But they did search my my luggage in the room. Yeah. You renamed the movie. Last just, Flight In? Yeah, Last Flight In. So they, you know, they they thought, oh, that's, that's exactly the point now. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, when I went, before going to Saigon, you know, the, the name of Saigon was changed to Ho Chi Minh City. Yeah. And I looked up on the departure board in Bangkok, and I'm looking at Ho Chi Minh City flight number and so on. And it was so strange to see that change. And even to this day, I still call it Saigon. I, I, I have never called it Ho Chi Minh City. While I was there that week in Saigon, uh, I went back to the Pan Am office downtown. I had a nice office with pictures of Pan Am airplanes um, on the wall and so on. So I went back to the office, and it was now a French trading company took over that facility. So I went into my actual office, and on the wall, the, all those pictures were gone. There was only one picture behind the desk on the wall. And it was a picture of Ho Chi Minh <laughs> <laughs> on so my desk. Pr Protegetical or what? Or, you know, is this the, was this the revenge for the last flight out? You don't know. No. <laughs> guess. He's, guess who's watching. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you one more thing about that visit back there. I went back to the house we lived in. We lived in an old French villa. It was a beautiful place. 18 foot high ceilings and everything. And uh, I had an office in the house. Went into my office in the house that we used to live in. On the desk, in the middle of the desk, in the office, was the American Embassy telephone directory that I left there, you know, 17 years earlier. 
So they kept the book. The family living in the house was actually a retired, uh, he didn't speak any English, but I had an interpreter with me. He was a retired North Vietnamese general living, mm-hmm. living in the house. So it was kind of interesting to, to go back to that house and see that phone book still on the desk. You told them personally your story at that moment? Oh, yeah. Time. Yeah. I, well, I told them that I used to live here. You know, I used to Pan Am manager and all that sort of stuff. And they... They enjoy, in fact, he had a granddaughter there that played the piano, and she she played a, a piece for me. I have no idea what what it was called, but it was pretty good. It, it was not the same, um, you know, um, it can't beat the experience tone, right? No, <laughs> coincidentally, you know, yeah, a Pan Am commercial. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you being there, you having seeing this of the the animals, you know, being shipped out uh, from the embassy staff, and that are. American families, you know, living in Vietnam. And I suppose also, you know, only 24 hours later, the FAA sends a message saying, you know, you're making your decision because you talked to the chairman of the board um, in in New York. But 24 hours after this, this, this call on when you should pull out, the FAA says, oh, all flights between the United States and Vietnam have to be canceled. And you are furious, I believe. I oh, yeah. I, I said, You've got to be kidding. I mean, this is, we have everything pretty much in place. And this came out of left field. We started making, I started making phone calls to everyone I could think of. And uh, our folks back in New York and Washington was, they were able to, to come up with a plan that was very, I mean, it was, it was a, I don't know who actually came up with the idea, but it worked. And what happened was the FAA had suspended all commercial flights into Vietnam all for all U.S. carriers. With you being in the country at this, it makes it, how, how do you, how did, how can they make a decision like that without, you know, I mean, even talking to you, who's, you know, the, the manager for the biggest U.S. carrier in the country. It doesn't make any sense. Well, you know, FAA is is FAA, right? They're in charge of all uh, U.S. carriers in terms of air weatherness and uh, air routing and so on. And it was, it was a dangerous situation. And uh, just not to have any U.S. carriers uh, at risk of being shot down, uh, that was their decision because it was a very hostile environment at that time. Mm-hmm. At that time, North Vietnamese troops had cities surrounded pretty much within 20, 35 miles away. And uh, 747 is pretty easy target from, you know, from that distance. In addition to Pan Am, uh, Air France was still operating a 747 in there. Uh, Cathay Pacific was operating. Uh, Thai Airways operating. Well, Northwest uh, Flying Tigers had stopped operating. Northwest had occasional flights in there. But U.S. carriers were were banned from operating commercial flights. So you can operate, uh, in order to operate a non-commercial flight, what they did, what they came up with, which was really a godsend, was the Pan Am flight between the Philippines and Vietnam and the and Vietnam back to the Philippines was now being redesignated as a U.S. government charter, so it was no longer a commercial flight. That's how they got around it, and which was was genius. I mean, when I saw that message saying that our flights have been suspended, I was I was in deep trouble. I mean, I had no other way. I mean, I personally I could get out. Because I could jump on, you know, Thai Airways or Air France or someone and get out. Because they, they operate to the end. They did operate. I remember someone, I was talking to someone, they operated on the day that the North came in. They were still operating as if nothing happened. Well, you know what? I think a lot of conversation went on behind the scenes to, to let that happen. Because I can tell you that when we were loaded and we were with over almost 500 people on an airplane, and we're sitting at the end of the runway with four engines running, waiting for clearance for takeoff. I was I was very worried because I'm thinking they may be calling us back to the gate area and inspect all the folks on board for some reason, or just come up with something to to delay our departure. And once we got the clearance and we started that takeoff roll, and I'm sitting in the jump seat behind the captain. And I'm looking out the window and looking at the Saigon terminal for the last time. And we're rolling and rolling and rolling. And finally, we're wheels up. 
and we took a steep climb out and I was, uh, I had, I had visions. I'll tell you this, the truth. I thought we were probably going to get shot down. I really did. And I'm thinking in a matter of seconds, I'm thinking all these things like the headline on the New York times, Pan Am jet shot down in Vietnam, no survivors. I'm, I could see that headline. I really could. I, I was kind of holding my breath for the entire takeoff roll. And finally, we started climbing out, climbing out, climbing out, climbing out. And eventually, we're, you know, we're now up probably 25,000 feet or so, 30,000 maybe. I don't remember exactly what it was, but we were, we were climbing out and we're crossing the coastline of South Vietnam. I look out the window and I see all these U.S. Navy ships out there waiting for the evacuation to start and to, to accommodate all the people that would be eventually end up on these ships out in the South China Sea. So once I saw that, I knew we were clear. We were, we were good to go. You know, that was, that was a very, very scary time for me. And, uh, but all those lives, it would have been a disaster. I guess, how did you beat the U.S. government even in that case to the, to the evacuation itself, you know? How did I what? Well, it wasn't, you know, there was, it, wouldn't there be more coordination between the likes of Pan Am and the U.S. government to evacuate at the same time? Rather than, that's very interesting that, you know, Pan, you sort of beat the U.S. government in that, that they, you evacuated before even they did. Yeah. And that's really impressive. I mean, I mean, that's good. I don't know what math you used there, but no. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I used to go to meetings at the embassy when they were talking about evacuation plans. And the embassy plan was that there would be certain rooftops within the city that we designated where people could go and wait for helicopters. And when I found out, I'm sitting in that meeting I, and I've started thinking about this plan. I said, there's no way that's going to work for us. <laughs> I said, we've got to come up with our own plan because I, I can't imagine telling 62 employees and 300 relatives uh, to, to where to go, what rooftop to go on. What do you do if you're on this rooftop and no helicopter shows up? What do you do? What do you do if a helicopter does show up and it takes you out to one of these ships how do I know, how am I ever going to find you again? You know, it was just, it just, it just had too many things that could go wrong for me. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to keep my group together and go out on a Pan Am airplane. And uh, finally, we were able to pull it off with the adoption this thing that we did. And I, I just can't, I could not imagine telling all those employees to go to some rooftop. Mm. I mean, I'm sure the embassy was going to, give you a list of rooftops to go to but how do you how do you do that i, I just it, it just didn't work as it turned out the the rooftop that was that was really uh used was the embassy rooftop yeah. and it was mostly for u.s u.s uh personnel but a lot of americans didn't get out a lot of Vietnamese also got out and a lot of oh, americans yeah. didn't right but the most of them got out by helicopter from the airport not not from a rooftop. Mm. Yeah, there's that famous picture. Yes, yeah, 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 with the line going up the yeah, stairs, yeah, going up the ladder there, mm -hmm. that rope ladder, whatever that was. And that's that was not the embassy. That was the uh, building like across the street. It was publicized at one time. It was the the embassy rooftop, but it really wasn't. And and how about your staff in Cambodia and all that? And how about the oh, people we in didn't, Cambodia? Oh, we didn't really have anybody there. The, the Air Cambodia would would handle our flight. We we really had limited operations to camp to uh, Phnom Penh. Maybe occasionally a cargo flight might go in there, but during my time there, that service was pretty much. Uh, you know, just on paper, but not in reality. I guess the movie puts it, you know, in everything happening in three days, which is a bit too much. It did not happen all like that in three days where you sent your wife home. Right. You know, you, you didn't send your wife home in three days. And then the fax comes in that, you know, the FAA is going to close the, um, close the uh, Vietnam airspace. And then all of a sudden, it, you know, two hours later, you get a call that, oh, it's fine. There's no problem, you know. Right. Uh, and then you get out of the country. No. What's the actual time span that this sort of happened, that you've been noticing this, you know, and you've had all these, you know. Well, you know, the whole thing really started to unravel gradually, I would say, in February. 
And then in March, it started picking up a little steam. So February 1975, right. and then going March 1975. Yeah, I mean, the month of April had a lot going on. I mean, the first tragedy was the C5A that crashed on April 4th. And then there was another incident three days, four days later on April 8th, I believe, um, a South Vietnamese pilot uh, got into an F-5. He flew over our office and it sounded like he was about a hundred feet off from the rooftop. And the next thing I heard was this big explosion and he dropped a bomb. Uh, he tried to bomb the, the presidential palace, right? And his big boom went off and you could hear it. The sales office was full of people. Everybody's screaming and running out the door. And my secretary, <laughs> she comes in the office. She says, Mr. Topping, the Viet Cong are here. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, I'm laughing now, but it wasn't funny. At the time, I thought she was right because I said to myself, oh, gosh, uh, we waited too long. It's too late. I mean, I really did believe what she said. So the first thing I did was I got in the car with the driver, headed out towards the airport, and the, the roads were just clogged with people and People are just running all over the place. Saigon is under attack, blah, blah, blah. I'm in the car and people are looking at me in the car like there's an American. He's leaving too, you know. <laughs> Proves I, the point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was chaos. I finally got to the airport. By the time I got to the airport, because I, I had a, uh, a two-way radio, a walkie-talkie with the embassy security people. And I was able to listen in and talk to them. And they said what it was was a South Vietnamese pilot that decided to bomb the president's old palace. And then he landed the plane in Benoit, I believe. Kind of an isolated incident. In the meantime, we had a flight coming in that day from Manila, right? With like 300 people booked on that flight. And all of a sudden, I get word from New York and Manila that the Pan Am flight's going to be probably canceled because Saigon is under attack. And I got on the phone. I said, no, 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 no. You cannot you cannot cancel this flight today. It's not under attack. It was an isolated incident. I explained it to them and everything. And finally, they, they agreed to reinstate the flight. And fortunately, that flight did operate, came in way behind schedule. We went out with over 300 people on that plane, and no one... Uh, complained about the delay. People wanted to get out, you know. And like I said, I, I really thought at that moment, at that moment that, that I waited too long. Because it was it was scary. It was it was very scary. I mean you're in a you're in a country that's surrounded by North Vietnamese troops and you hear an airplane coming over your office at you know at high speed and making a tremendous amount of noise. I mean, the building was sh shaking almost. And then, then then you hear an explosion. Then you hear an office full of people screaming and running out in the street. I mean, it it was it was scary. I really thought I, I thought you know what this could be this could be it. But fortunately, it was just uh, an isolated incident. My gosh. That's what I said. <laughs> uh, and a few other things, too. It was, it was a time I'll never forget. So that flight, that one that left late, was one of the last flights already. That one that on Thursday was one of the last flights. That that was the last flight. No, the one, um, the one when the Viet Cong, the one. Oh, the, the, the airplane. Yes, the bomb. That was already one of the very. That was one, That was on. That was on April eighth. So that was like. Three weeks to three weeks before we actually departed. No, I, I like I said, I really thought that I blew it. I mean, I waited too long. The thing is, I, I didn't want to. My dilemma was I didn't want to to shut the operation down too soon because so many people wanted to get out, and I didn't want to shut the operation down too late because. That airplane might still be there. I don't know. Um, so that was the dilemma. And in fact, the M the ambassador wanted us to increase our our schedule and add another airplane every you know on another day. And I told him that we couldn't justify that because we're not going out full. Mm. You know, we're not leaving people behind. We we always had empty seats. And the other thing for me was. 
I was always fearful of our airplane on the ground getting hit by a rocket. There were rockets hitting the airport, right? They come out of the airport. Well, not, not the airport itself, but in the area. There was always some activity going on, but uh, not the airport itself. But, you know, I, I think, like I said before, a lot of conversation went on behind the scenes to to permit uh, to to permit to permit this operation to to continue because they could have they could have blown us out of the sky at any time you know when we operated the two seven forty sevens with the, uh, the the children which was um, what when was that, when was that, that was April fifth April fifth where the um, day after the C five A crash where they have the picture of Gerald Ford in San Francisco right. receiving one of those seven forty seven flights yes I told New York that. Uh, on these two 747s, let's not have them both on the ground at the same time because that would be a tremendous target. I mean, the the terrain around Saigon was very flat. You could see a tail of a 747 from, you know, a couple miles away or more. And I said, let's make sure that the second airplane, which was coming in from Bangkok, I think, not come in until the first one is loaded and, and gone. So we wouldn't have them both there at the same time. That would be really a tempting target. So actually it was beautiful. We locked up and uh, oh, but here's one more thing I have to mention. The C5A crash at the time. On April 5th, yeah. April 4th, actually. April 4th. We did not know what caused it. We did know that the aft cargo door was blown off and people were sucked out. And the captain, I think his name was Trainer, um, was able to maneuver with limited controls to try to make it. Because they were already around, I think they were almost, uh, they were like 25, 26,000 feet out before the, when this happened. And they made, were able to get back and maneuver with limited control and ended up short of the runway, bounced in the rice paddy, and the airplane split in four pieces, I believe. But we didn't know what caused the accident. Was it sabotage? Was it shot down or whatever? So the next day, this is something I'll never forget also. We're loading these children on the plane, babies, infants, and older. And since we didn't know, since we didn't know what happened with the C-5 incident, um, we were Padding down the baby's diapers to make sure there are no explosives. Yes, that you were, you said that in the book. Yes, that was that was, and there's pic, I think there's the pictures of that. That uh, you know, that whole thing took a long. Yeah. Yeah, and so anyhow, we loaded up the first airplane. He's he's just about taking off. I look and I see the other one on final approach coming in. So as he was taking off, the other one was coming in, and we did the same thing all over again with padding them down. And loading them up, and I'll tell you, God bless those crew members that came in and operated those flights, our flight attendants and pilots, and especially the ones that came in on April twenty fourth. Uh, it was a volunteer crew; they didn't have to come. Volunteer nurses and doctors that were on the flight. That was uh, that was quite a when I when I saw those airplanes leave with all those kids on there, I just said. My gosh, how, they're flying all the way across the Pacific Ocean with all those kids. In fact, a couple of them died in route to, oh, right. to, to the United States. I, I think at least two that I can recall passed away. They were, they were very sick to begin with. The night before that final departure, I, I went through a list in my head of what if. What if we get the airport gets bombed tonight, the runway's got great big holes in it, uh, the buildings get destroyed, we're not having a flight tomorrow. What if the crew members decide, you know what, we're not going there, it's too hot, we're not going in there. What if that happens? Uh, so what if our people can't get through the airport checkpoint tomorrow morning with, with the paperwork? I got all the paperwork, a big stack of forms, and... I met the the three buses at the at the uh, point of entry to the airport, and I gave it to the the uh, South Vietnamese Army. Didn't even really look at it. He just sort of took one quick look and gave it back to me. But he walked through each bus with his M16 on his shoulder and looked at everybody, and everybody just was in a, some kind of a 
days, you know, they were just glossing over. And uh, fortunately, after he checked three buses, he let them through. Because that was another one of my what ifs. What if we can't get through the gate? I've got this airplane sitting there. I've got all this paperwork. And they say no. What do you do? It was like this. It was a stack up because it's, uh, it was like 700 people for 700 people, 600, 700 people, right? More or less. No, it was for 300, but each person had maybe 10 pages <laughs> or something like that. So it was a big stack of papers. He wasn't going to read all that stuff, you know, but everything was officially stamped by the Ministry of, uh, in, the Ministry of Interior. It was all official, you know. Mm-hmm. But I, that was another one of my uh, what ifs. What if they decide that the paperwork is bogus, you know? I, I, it was kind of sad, I mean, in so many ways to see what happened at the end after, you know, how many uh, close to 60,000 Americans were killed, uh, millions of Vietnamese, North and South Vietnamese killed, wounded, how many, uh, I mean, after all of that, and now I've got a golf hat that says made in Vietnam. Yeah, all, most of Nike, a lot of Nike shoes are made in yeah, Vietnam. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Incredible. So you you don't, th- looking back at it now after so many years, you don't think it, for us to be there, it, made, it didn't make much sense. You think, looking back at it now after many, after all these years. Kissinger was Secretary of State at the time. The United States decided they wanted to stop the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. And they decided to use Vietnam as as the checkpoint. It won't go any further than here. So we took a stand with the South Vietnamese government. And uh, we wanted Vietnam to be a, a democracy, South Vietnam to be a democracy, and be part of the, you know, the international community. What do we have now? It's not a democracy, but it's part of the international community. Air Vietnam... When they call it Vietnam Airlines, they're flying into San Francisco now. And Pan Am is not flying anymore. How about that? In fact, when I saw that they started their service, I sent a message to the public relations guy, whoever it was. Uh, I was on Facebook. And I said, I used to be the Pan Am manager in uh, Saigon in 1975. And congratulations on your service to the United States. I was hoping he would say, well, why don't you come on over and take one of our flights? Yeah. <laughs> but he, he just said, thank you very much. We uh, hope you'll you'll fly with us sometime. <laughs> <laughs> wow, not taking really much of an appreciation for what he received. I suppose, yeah, but. but I mean, Vietnam Airlines... It used to be called Air Vietnam, but now it's called Vietnam Airlines. They've got these brand new Boeings, you know, flying across the Pacific. Going back to, you know, the last, I mean, from April 5th to April 24th, that Thursday, you know, what were people still flying into Vietnam then? Were people flying in on Pan Am or were those flights just empty? Oh, no. The, they were, the people coming in during that time were a lot of uh, embassy types, State Department types, uh, former military types, but no, no tourism or nothing like that. No, the planes were pretty much in, coming in with, I mean, you could put all the folks in, you know, three or four rows on the plane. Uh, but going out, it was, you, you're talking 250 to 300 people every day. Uh, some folks coming back to find the the mother of their child that they, you know, it's just all, a lot of complication. As a matter of fact, one day, I don't remember exactly when, but it probably was in April, but there was a uh, an American former uh, service person, military. He had come back, and I don't know what happened, but he came back and this woman that was seeing him off at the airport with with a child, uh, but he she was staying behind, and he was getting back on Pan Am to come back to the states. And as he was about to leave the gate area, she just clawed him with her nails right in the face and screamed at him, and blood was coming down his face. So we got him out of there real quick and got him on the plane and the 
flight attendants were able to do some first aid and get him cleaned up a little bit. But she, I, I mean, I, I kind of, you know, <laughs> reading between the lines, she didn't, she wanted to go too, obviously, yeah. but he, she was not able to go. He, I guess she didn't have the paperwork. But that was a thing that was kind of crazy. The place is falling apart, but the government is still in control. <laughs> you know, that, that was that was something always that was on my mind. Looking, you know, looking at that the, the video and, the, and reading the book, right. you know, reading the book Wings of Freedom. It really was always on my mind how how could they be so much in control even to the last moment? You know, even I mean, just to pay it off was even to just pay off someone was hard. I mean, that is that does that show really the um, the honesty of of of, via, of the Vietnamese of that time, or what does that show? You know, towards one's job. I don't know. I don't, is that. What, what is it? The people that were in control wanted to be in control right to the very end, you know. And the the president left on a, a 707 that we leased to them. We had arranged to lease to them. Um, he left, um, I want to say, early April maybe. Or maybe, a little, yeah, maybe mid-April he left. Went to uh, Taiwan and I think Hong Kong. And I think he spent some time in France as well, uh, but he passed away. But he left with, you know, a lot of luggage, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> by all means, a lot of money, yes. <laughs> you know, between still April 5th and, and, and 24th, why was Pan Am the only airline to leave? Why Why didn't Thai, why didn't Air France stop? Why didn't Cafe stop? What, what was, you know, this Friday and it seemed like, only Pan Am at this Friday and no one else at this Friday at that time. The other airlines were operating because they were not restricted from operating. You know, it was it was still operating daily flights or, well, they weren't daily, but they were twice a week maybe at the most. Uh, I think Cathay had probably the most flights and Air Vietnam was, was still flying. They were flying a 727 and a 707. They had uh, no restrictions. It was, the airport was operating, you know, normally, even though the, the environment was was hostile, but they were operating. Yeah, Air France and Pan Am were the only two with 747s coming in on a scheduled basis. There had to be um, some very serious negotiations going on behind the scenes to, to permit that to take place. Uh, even Royal Air Cambodge <laughs> had a had a caravel. That was the only plane I've ever seen that, that they had, just that one airplane, I think. And they would they'd be flying into Saigon. Uh, uh, I mean, from, from Phnom Penh to Saigon was like flying from San Francisco to Sacramento, you know, it was pretty close by. In fact, I went over there on, on the caravel one time to, to the embassy just to say hello. No, they, they had every right to operate. They had the operating rights and, and people were getting on the planes. I mean, there were people going from Saigon to Hong Kong on Cathay Pacific and going to Paris and Europe on Air France, uh, Thai Airways going to Bangkok, you know, a short flight to Bangkok. They were... Uh, they were operating. In fact, when I went back for the first time, I flew on Thai Airways from uh, Bangkok to uh, Saigon. Now, April 24th arrives. How did that day start? How did that day begin? Well, first of all, I didn't sleep that night. I was up all night thinking about all the things that that we have to do in the morning when this plane comes in. And what did I forget to do? What would I, you know, what's going to happen to the office? What's going to happen to the employees that, in fact, I had employees that I had laid off when I first took over the job because they wanted me to reduce the staffing and expenses a little bit, which I had a hard time doing that because when you compare the production you were getting for what the salary were, it wouldn't, didn't really make a lot of sense to me to, to lay some of these folks off, but I had no choice. We had some employees that I had laid off two years earlier. They were coming in asking uh, about getting out on our on our flight. And I told them that, you know, uh, this is really for active employees, but if you, if you get uh, 
proper documentation will will help you out. You know, you just I I wanted to make sure we didn't start some kind of a you know stampede of sorts. I mean, all of a sudden you start having people coming out of the woodwork that they used to work for Pan Am, you know, years ago, and then that could become a problem because the priority was to get our active current employees out, not not go back in time. Frankly, if anybody was able to to get there and get on, get through the security and everything, I I wouldn't stop them, you know. But I, I didn't want to encourage that too much because uh, we had enough issues going on without that factor coming into it. But it was, uh, it was a very difficult time. I mean, and some people were able to get out other ways, you know. They just, we, we knew they, they were gone. We didn't know that they got, they had a friend at the embassy and got on one of the embassy flights that were ro- running all the time. One of the embassy flights, not being the helicopters, but. No, this is regularly, they were going out on C-141s. C-141s, cargo flights were coming in. And they have limited seats on those, maybe 50 seats. I don't remember exactly, but they would come in with, with military uh, supplies for the South Vietnamese Army, just dump it at the airport. So instead of going back empty to Bangkok or wherever to get more stuff, they would put some embassy people on there and people, that, Vietnamese that used to work for the embassy, which was a lot, a lot. They would put them on, on those planes. In fact, one gal that worked for us. She was Vietnamese, Chinese. Uh, she wanted to get out and she was working at the airport. This was maybe a week before our final departure. I said, well, when you go up to the airplane to close the door to give the flight attendant the manifest, I said, just close the door behind you. And she just went to Guam with nothing, you know, just her uniform and a, and a purse. And she did this two, two, one, two weeks before? This was probably a week before. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, she just went on the plane. My secretary, she had a young baby. Her baby was, uh, I mean, probably less than a year old, maybe a year old at the most. And her husband was going to school in Boston at university and she she put she put the baby on one of the uh 747s on april 5th and told her one of the two 747s with the you know his contact and everything on on the wrist and she called him in boston and told him to to go to seattle or san francisco to meet the flight. And that's how she, she sent the baby and stayed behind, which I, I don't, I don't know why she did that. I mean, she probably had other family there too, but, uh, but she sent the, well, the kid doesn't, has no idea what's going on anyway, but he, he was sent unaccompanied. I mean, in a way. You have these incidents in the morning where, you know, two or, employees try to get on the two previous two past employees try to get on the flight and and then how does that morning proceed from then on that morning how does it proceed the the main thing at that point was um, to make sure that the the buses there would be there'd be three buses to go to the ticket office downtown to pick up everyone people slept in the office overnight a lot of in the back room there and uh and then uh make sure that the buses leave as soon as possible and get to the airport and when i called downtown to find out how things were going with the sales manager he said that the office is full of people and the buses have just arrived how do i how do i get get the people out of the office and and get our people on the buses but meanwhile people are coming out of the back room and getting on the buses and the people are in the front at the office trying to buy tickets or find out information about reservations and all that i said to him look i don't know how you're going to do it but you've got to do it just get everybody out as soon as possible and put a sign on the door that says pan am office temporarily closed 
And sure enough, he was on the bus. Temporary close forever, yeah. Yeah. That was another one of my what ifs. What if we can't get, you know, people out of the building? You can't just leave it open, even though you're not going to be there anymore. You know, you just, but he was able to do it. But I think most of the people at that time were, they were just trying to get, get a ticket from the states to be wired in and they're waiting for that to come through but i don't think we turned anybody away that really had a ticket for that flight because they could have just gotten on the bus you know with the others but uh those were just some some moments of a lot of suspense because there's so much going on you got Buses with people, you've got a plane coming in, you got the airport perimeter is surrounded by thousands of people trying to get through to go in and they don't have proper, you know, uh, documentation. And there's this great big 747 sitting there ready to go to the United States. It's only going to carry so many people and, and that's about the end of the story, you know. Uh, so so you, you end up going... You end up passing the barriers. You end up boarding the plane. What happens the moment when you board the plane with with the people from the buses? Because you park the buses. You don't park the buses next to the terminal. You park. You just drive the buses straight next to the aircraft as if we got to go now. We need to get out of here. Like, right. let's go. Yeah. I mean, three buses, you know, lined up in a line right up to the bottom of the steps. And people got off. Went up the steps, and uh, that was that was basically a, a typical boarding, you know, because there were no jetways. There was it was tarmac and then and, and steps, and so in order to get to the plane, usually it was parked. Um, most of the times, we would bus people from the terminal to the plane, but some people would walk. It wasn't that far, but some people would walk. But buses going there. Uh, but as as this whole thing was unfolding, you're just worried that something is going to happen that you're not a, that you didn't plan for, because there's just this great big airplane sitting out there and these people teaming onto the plane, and uh, people now know that this this is it for Pan Am, and uh, you're just worried because it's you, you're not. You're in a uh, an environment where there are people out there with rockets that can see the tail of this plane, and they know that you know. I mean, there, there are a lot of people that wanted to leave. I mean, people in uniform wanted to leave. You know, and, and they did. And they, they did at that moment, right? They they took off their they their took, they, their um, they took they, off their uniform. And they ran onto the plane. Right? Guys, I think we had about six of them that had taken off the uniform and I could see under their shirt, their shirt was hanging down, I could see a, a weapon. That was kind of initially very scary Then I thought about it real quickly. I said, you know what? These guys are not going to hijack this plane to Hanoi. <laughs> they want to go to the United States just like we all do. And fortunately, I was right. Once we boarded and were locked up in the, in the air, we collected a half a dozen weapons and put them in the cockpit for safekeeping. But... Uh, that was that was kind of a scary moment. B. That was that was a risk because who knows? You know, you let a guy on a plane with a gun, and anything could happen. You know, but I, I just knew that the fact that they were not in uniform anymore and they they wanted to to flee. I'll tell you, people were who were very um, afraid of being captured. Maybe the right word once we pulled out, you know, and they go door to door, block to block, find out who you are, who you work for and, uh, have total control, you know? Um, and if you worked for the U S government, you were probably going to have a hard time. These soldiers get on the plane, everyone boards the plane. Then that moment comes right. That you could, co you collect the currency of everyone on the aircraft oh. as you're about to leave. That was done before departure. Yeah. And gave it to the uh, local police. You gave, so you collected, when was that, so you collected all everyone's money boarding the aircraft. When, when boarding the aircraft, or was that? After after they were on board. After they were on board, you, you collected everyone's money to pay off the police so you could actually leave. 
Well, I, I didn't really collect it, but the flight attendants got involved in that and some other folks. And uh, I kind of, I was kind of worried about that type of thing going on because, uh, you know, I didn't know what might happen. Uh, I did know that the currency was pretty much worthless. So it wasn't like a, a loss to anyone. I mean, the people that put money in the pillowcases, uh, they couldn't do much with piastas in Guam <laughs> or California. I mean, it was it was worthless. But it was just an insurance, right? It wasn't that the, they came up to you. It wasn't that they came up to you. No. And they said, oh, you cannot take off. You just did this as an insurance. It, it was, it it was, was like a, one of those things where you, you saw a possibility of a, a problem coming up that would cause some kind of delay or whatever. And, you know, greasing the palms usually works, you know, in that situation. The Vietnamese National Bank came out, um, I would say that probably happened in late March, maybe. They had a crate, a wooden crate, to be shipped as cargo to New York on, on our flight. And uh, they wanted me to sign the documents that we are receiving this. And I looked at this paperwork, and it said that that crate contained $4 million in U.S. currency. And I said, I can't sign that. He says, why not? I said, because I don't know. I have, I have, you have to open the crate. I don't know what's in there. <laughs> And the guy said, no, it's it's okay. you got to sign it. I said, no, I'm not signing it. Finally, with a lot of dialogue going on, they they went ahead and put it on the plane, and I never signed for it. Well, I went to the captain. I said, look, here's what happened. They have a crate. It's in the belly. They said it's got currency in it. But I said, I, I don't know what's in it because I can't see it. I see. I said to him, do you want? I said, okay. He said, yeah, let, let's stay. It's okay. He, he said, okay, no problem. But uh, I found out later that, in fact, it, it was U.S. dollars, but all the dollars were punched so that you couldn't use them. Oh, so because then it could track you back to where? It, so it's like a credit to the Vietnam account. It goes to the net, the Federal Reserve. Yeah. But I, I never... I never saw the money, but they they said it was four million dollars in there. But I don't I don't know. But that wasn't on the same flight. That was a different. No, this was not on the last flight. No, that would have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was useless because it was all punched already. How did you compare this evacuation to what we saw? What you would see for what Pan Am did, for example, in the in seventy nine with the, with Iran. I don't know too much about that, uh, but I imagine it was it was probably. Uh, a little more hectic because I think they were, um, you know, if you if you were an American, you were you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, you know. In Vietnam, it wasn't so much Americans getting out; it was more Vietnamese getting out. Mm -hmm. You know, this was a whole totally different situation. But I mean, if you look at what happened in Afghanistan when they were trying to climb up in the belly of that C-17, I mean, that was, uh, th th that photograph of the interior of that airplane, it looked like a football field in there. Mm, yeah. I mean, people were just, they were just thousands of people in that plane. It's unbelievable photograph. I've never seen anything like it. We had some chaos and we had uh, some uncertainties, but we, I think we had a little more control. Mm. Yeah. Because we were we were really, it wasn't like special flights coming and taking people out, except for the two baby lift flights. But our regular schedule flight just came in normally as it normally did and went out as it normally did and didn't have any, any real issues. But at the same time, we, we had, when I decided that we had to be out of there before uh, May 1st, because that's May Day, it's a big holiday. And I, For the I, communists. Right. And I knew that that would be the ideal time for them to actually take over. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, the ambassador left on the 30th, you know. <laughs> uh, 
just 24 hours before the tanks rolled into downtown. So they were just sort of poised outside of town waiting for May 1st. So that worked out uh, very fortunate for that one. But like I said before, we didn't want to leave too early and we didn't want to leave too late. And fortunately, it, it worked out. When I was talking to Edward Trippi, the son of Juan Trippi, he was, he, um, under, before you came to Vietnam, he was working under, I believe, your, your predecessor. Um, and he was doing an internship there in Saigon. And he was offered to do the partial deliveries, you know, for the CIA. Pan Ams, you know, um, before the uh, what happened in Lebanon, for example, with Pan Am leaving Lebanon in 73, their, their chief of security was part of CIA or Caracas. Many, many people, you know, Pan Am has a big connection with the CIA, at least until the, the, the middle, late 70s, beginning of 80s, right? Did that have any role in the Saigon station or with you? The uh, CIA representative in Saigon, one of them was a guy named Frank Snepp, and he wrote a book called Decent Interval. And I knew him, uh, but never had any dealings with him at all. And by the time uh, I got there, things, the whole environment was totally different. You know, he had a ceasefire agreement, and peace was at hand, and so on. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I had. Frank, I knew him. He'd been at the house. We'd have some, sometimes some cocktail parties for clients and so on. And I knew the ambassador very well. He, his daughter, Janet Martin, was a Pan Am flight attendant, and she'd come and visit him and her mother there at in Saigon. Uh, you know, maybe a couple times a year. So it was a, it was a nice connection. Uh, I got to know uh, the ambassador's secretary. She was married to the, which, which was kind of interesting. She was married to a journalist for the LA Times. Uh, not the one you talked to. No. Not I, the one you talked to on the flight back no, after you're leaving the last flight no, of Vietnam to the US. No. no, this was somebody else. Gave me some advice on my golf swing, <laughs> which I won't talk about. Never had any, any, uh, connections with them at all. And you know what's really interesting too, when I went back for the first time 15 years later and went to the Pan Am office, I, I think I have a picture in the book of it. There's a Pan Am logo. Pan Am logo still over the door. Yeah. 15 years later, they never took that decal off, which was, I mean, I, I just saw that logo. I couldn't believe it was still up there. So why do people say that there's this big connection with the with, between Pan Am and the CIA, or is it true? It was just a thing of a different time. Oh, I, I think there was probably some involvement. I mean, Pan Am has was an American, known as an American flag carrier, right? And we flew into places that no other American carrier flew into. You know, for example, we would be flying into, I want to say, Robertsville in Liberia and Lagos, Nigeria. Of course, now some of those places, they've change their names. I can't keep up with that anymore. But um, Yeah, Monrovia. Robert Shield is Monrovia. Right. Today, yeah. And uh, so some of those places, um, we got involved in, in uh, giving technical assistance to those carriers in those countries, helped to develop them and so on. So that was all sort of government related. We, we would work with certain governments on uh, doing uh, things like that. And... Uh, we had a what they call a technical assistance program. We were trying to get, like, airlines in Jordan, for example. Uh, we were involved with Jordanian Airlines. And, in fact, um, one of Pan Am's past CEOs, Najib Halabi. Yes. His daughter married the king of Jordan. I'm trying to think of her name. I can't think of it right now. But, anyway... He, his Pan Am had a, an, a, his daughter was working in this technical assistance program with Air Jordan, I think, and she's very attractive. And uh, the king <laughs> took a liking to her, I guess. And uh, you know, they she became Queen Queen Noor, yeah, mm -hmm. of Jordan, yeah. Yeah, we we were involved in Latin America quite. I mean, we started in Latin America. I mean, the first flight was Key West to Havana, and then we started. That's where our original roots were in Latin America, and uh, so you, you're working with 
with governments all the time. In fact, we flew, we flew Roosevelt, mm. Churchill, and Stalin. You flew Stalin as well? I thought it was only uh, Roosevelt and Churchill. I didn't know it was Stalin too. Uh, yeah, there's a picture of them on, on a Pan Am Clipper. I'm pretty sure Stalin was there, but I know for sure Churchill and and Roosevelt. Yeah. But we, we pioneered so much. I mean, we built, you know, uh, when Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, uh, Juan Tripp grabbed him right away and put him on the, on the payroll. And he was uh, involved in uh, pioneering routes and evaluating routes and the trips and... Uh, Lindbergh spent a lot of time together flying all over on Pan Am back in the good old days. How did it feel to work at the world's yeah. greatest airline at that time? That just because the seventies was still the height. Yeah, I'll tell you, my my first airline job was with United Airlines at JFK in New York, right? And uh, I worked there for five years, working as a customer service agent, and uh, I used to. I, I used to meet a lot of VIPs, celebrities, and the various executives. And Pan Am at the time didn't have any operating rights between New York and California. It was strictly international from East and West Coast. So I got to meet some Pan Am folks. And one day I I went over to the Pan Am terminal, you know, because I always looked at Pan Am. I mean, United was a big airline, but I looked at Pan Am as just... A cut above in terms of international stature and so on. I mean, to me, if you if you flew on Pan Am, you needed a three piece suit, you know. <laughs> Not today, but that's the way it was. It just you just fit that image. So I went over to the Pan Am terminal for the first time one day. I went over there just to take a look around because I was curious. So I looked, walked in. I looked up on the the uh, departure board. And I see London, Paris, Rome, Bombay, Frankfurt. So I said, wow. And I'm standing and looking at these flights and then these announcements coming on. Pan Am Flight 2, now boarding to London, you know. Wow. Impressed. So I go back to the United Terminal where I was working. Walked in, looked at the board, and I saw Chicago. <laughs> Pittsburgh, <laughs> Denver, and you know, it just didn't have that same ring to it. But until that time, when I was working at United, it was, you know, San Francisco, LA, Las Vegas, all, going, all these places. But once I saw those other uh, numbers like London and Paris and Rome, I said, wow, this is, this is big time. This is, this is the major leagues. But I, I was happy at United. But I got an offer from one of the Pan Am executives. He said, if you ever decide to leave United, give me a call. So I did because I worked there five years and I wanted to get into marketing and sales. And they kept telling me that um, they had no openings. But I was not too sure about all that. But so I decided to, to go down to, to the Pan Am building and had an interview. And they offered me the job on the spot sales rep. Yeah. So I went back and told my boss that I decided I'm going to take this job. He's, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want you to leave. We want you to stay with us. So I said, no, I don't think so. I'm going to go ahead. Anyway, he talked me into going back down there for another interview with United VP. I went down and they offered me the sales job with United. Sounds like a dream job, but it's a headache job. It was to be the like a sports rep, because United carried all, this is before teams had their own airplanes, carried all the this professional teams, baseball, football. So you'd be in charge of setting up all those charters and all that. And you get to see all the games, because you'd go on some of the flights and all that. But it was, it was tempting, but I turned it down. Because I thought, you know, if, if I took that job and I decided, because to me, five years 
was just was a decision point for me. If I work somewhere five years, that's when I would make a decision. If the future looked good, I'd stay. If not, I'd try to move. So uh, I said, you know what? If I take this job with United, what's going to happen five years from now? I don't want to go through that again. So I just I decided to leave. I'll never. I will never f- regret that move. But having said that. United still operating. <laughs> <laughs> so it would have been a... My retirement package would have been a lot more attractive. Uh, yeah. yeah. It should have been part of the Sky Gods era. No. <laughs> so Al, I feel like we're this, we're really running out of time at this point, but I leave the, you know, the, the best for last. Do you feel the famous James Earl Jones plays you well? <laughs> In the movie, you know, Last Flight yeah, Out? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you what. To be portrayed by James Earl Jones is quite an honor. I mean, the guy is, he's, he's up there, you know? Um, and when you, when I first saw the finished product of the movie and I saw the, for the first time when someone spoke to him in the film and called him Al or Mr. Topping, I'm sitting in and in, in watching this. That that gave me a little bit of chills, you know, <laughs> because they normally they don't use your real name, but they use they use your real name. And when James Earl Jones is using using is you in a movie, it's it's really quite something. I I was. I was impressed. For the for the more in the age bracket at the time, they tried to get Denzel Washington yeah. to, to do it, but he had other commitments. He couldn't do it. So you would have been he Oh would, my gosh. He, he would have been he would have been more, you know, appropriate in terms of uh, the age, because at that time I was like, I don't know, thirty five years old or something, and James Earl Jones is I think right now pushing 90 or something. I don't know if I should feel sorry about that or if I should feel happy that, you know, you got James Earl Jones in the end over to to Washington. Well, I mean, they're both pretty good actors. Uh, But when you say James Earl Jones, nobody says, who's that? You know, (laughs) they all know who he is. Yeah, that was, that was quite an honor. I, uh, I'll never, I'll never get over that. When you watch part of your life, even though some of it was Hollywood, uh, when you watch part of your life and you, 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 your your real name is being used, you know it's it's uh, it's quite something. What, what, what was the biggest part of it being Hollywood that that you know was not you? You know, mm, well, was it you flipping over the you know the, the flipping over the desk like that? that okay, was, that was the best part. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you what, that's something I felt like doing, but I, I didn't do it. But that was, uh, that was definitely Hollywood. And the other, there was a couple other ones that I, that I know didn't happen. You know, um, some of our flight attendants, they, they brought in some extra uniforms to put on some of our female employees to kind of yes. fake them out and get them on the plane that way. And, uh, that, that was true. They did have the extra uniform. But there was one scene where they're in this adjoining office. Yes, yes. With the doors cracked open and you could see them, you know, uh, taking off their uniforms. And and my friend from, um, yeah. from Continental Air Services comes in and he looks in and he says, Hey, Al, does Jan know about this? Yeah. <laughs> that was funny. But that didn't happen either. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 he's saying also like, oh, you know, uh, you're really lonely, you know, <laughs> because you sent your wife back and you felt. <laughs> that's yeah, that's true. Yeah, you you remember that. That's good. You know that that didn't happen. And there was another scene that was um, the the flight attendant that came back to get her sisters out, and they they're they're heading back to the airport, and they get stopped by the military, and they take her passport and they shoot it. The machine gun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if that happened or not, but I I don't think so. But it could have, but I don't think so. I, I never did ask her about that, if that really happened. Mr. Topping, thank you so much. And 
um, please go ahead. Um, we're going to put the the link to the book <laughs> wings. We're going to put the link, the link to the book for wings of freedom, um, below and make sure to buy it. And we're also put the, um, the movie link below so you can also watch it. Um, so, and thank you so much for your topping. It was a great honor. Thank you. Um, and, uh, keep, uh, make sure to follow us and looking forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe and looking forward to seeing you on the next episode.